All right, this will be my first lecture ever inside the Arctic Circle. <laughs> Special challenge. It's nice to be speaking at a conference inspired by one of Tim Morton's own coined terms, dark ecology. There was a recent reviewer writing about Morton's book, and this reviewer said something like, Morton has an absolute genius for coining neologisms. And I think that's true. Dark ecology, hyperobjects, the mesh, the strange stranger, what am I missing? Um, the ecological thought. Morton is very good at coining new terms, and so I will be talking about hyperobjects today, one of his, his more influential coinages. Incidentally, he has an entire book of that title coming out in April, Hyperobjects. You can find it on Amazon already if you're interested. These were the Wellick lectures that Morton gave at the University of California at Irvine, and Columbia University Press automatically publishes every set of lectures given as the Wellick lectures in Irvine, and that will be coming out in April. And so uh, uh, Ari already pointed to some of the features of, of uh, Morton's dark ecology term. Uh, he pointed out that it implies, among other things, that we humans are interwoven with ecology. We don't stand at a, difference, a distance from it. That's true. There, there will probably be other new features of dark ecology that Morton explains in this book for the first time. But I think another thing that was probably meant by the adjective dark is that it's not always clear to us what objects are in, in the ecology and what they are doing. And this is one of the key ideas of object-oriented ontology as opposed to actor network theory. And I'm going to talk a little about the distinction between those two at the beginning. Uh, Bruno Latour, one of the most prominent actor network theorists, uh, is probably a thinker somewhat central to all of the topics we'll be covering in the next week or so. Now, uh, one of the very good things that Latour did, if I think about a book like We Have Never Been Modern, which everybody should read if they haven't, uh, is that I think that book does a devastating job of eliminating the subject-object distinction that we've had since Descartes, at least, in Western philosophy. Meaning that Latour does not start with the idea that there are two separate taxonomical kinds of entities, that there, you have people on the one side and inanimate things on the other. And people have arbitrary cultures that they choose based purely on their free will, and over here you have nature, which is purely mechanistic and deterministic. And so you start in most modern philosophy with a taxonomical difference in kind between two entities. Now, what Latour really accomplishes, and we have never been modern, is to get rid of that uh, dualism that was taken for granted for centuries by saying, he does, he, he does a form of what we call flat ontology, which means you start off by treating everything the same. And this has happened occasionally in the history of philosophy. This happened with phenomenology, for example, in 1900, with Edmund Husserl's logical investigations, where Husserl said we should not try to explain what the causes are of the things we experience, but simply treat everything as an experience. Simply describe everything very accurately the way we see it. And we should do that for human things, for natural things. And this gave birth to the entire school of philosophy called phenomenology, which is somewhat out of fashion in recent years, but was very important for most of the 20th century. And I would say that actor network theory is the most important philosophical method to arise since phenomenology. It's my opinion, but I would defend that opinion against all comers. Um, what does Latour do? Latour says that you can't start with the idea of natural and cultural as two different kinds of objects. You simply have to treat everything as an actor. Everything is real insofar as it acts. Now, you notice that natural things like hailstones and, and rocks and volcanoes can do things, and so can humans. Humans do things, and so can fic fictional characters. Fictional characters can change people's moods. They can change society's views about certain things. So fictional characters count as real actors. Um, I suppose things like square circles and, and uh, other imp logical impossibilities also count as actors because they have some effect. So this is Latour's standard, that everything is real insofar as it has an effect. What he doesn't like is the idea that a thing has any surplus outside of its acting. A thing is really just what it does. The name of a thing is simply a nickname for a series of, of actions that a thing undertakes. And this is, of course, also close to American pragmatism. You can see in somebody like Norcia Maris that the thought of Latour and the thought of pragmatism go very well together because they're pretty close. Latour once called himself the only French pragmatist. Because in pragmatism, you have this idea that a thing is what it does, and if you try to talk about a thing beyond what significance it has or what effect it has on something else, that's simply a waste of time. So that is, is how Latour approaches the situation. But I want to claim that Latour, 
the towards ecology, which is encompassed in the term he calls networks, everything is, is woven together in a network where things are affecting each other, I think Morton's adjective dark gets him away from the two a bit and more in the direction of object-oriented ontology, which is the idea that things are not entirely deployed in their networks. Things are more within their, what they're, sorry, things are more than what they are doing right now. And it's a fairly simple proof for that. If you were nothing more than your actions at this moment, how could we explain that you're going to be doing something different tomorrow or a week from now or a year from now? There has to be something held in reserve behind those actions. And this is something I would say actor network theory does not handle as well as it could. This actually is a very old philosophical argument. It goes way back to ancient Greece when Aristotle had some rivals known as the Megarians because they were from Megara near Athens. And the Megarians, who were actually quite influential in those days, held that a thing is only what it's doing, so that a house builder is only a house builder if he happens to be building a house this very instant. Otherwise, he's not. And Aristotle thought this sounded absurd, because you are losing there the difference between a master house builder who's sleeping and an ignorant house builder who might be trying to build a house right now or is awake right now. Uh, you are not just what you are doing right now. And this is what led Aristotle to invent one of his most famous terms, potentiality, a term that we all use in everyday life now. The idea that a thing is not ever entirely expressed. Now, I have other problems with that term, potentiality, as does Latour, but the basic intuition that Aristotle has there is good, which is that a thing is more than what it currently is. Otherwise, it could not be doing different things at different times. And I just want to point out when I start that that is a fairly unfashionable idea these days. The fashions in philosophy now tend to go towards in the direction that everything is networked, everything is just what it does, there's nothing in a thing hiding behind its appearance, everything is imminent, Everything is flux and flow, and everything is gradual, not made of continuous jerks. Uh, and in a sense, object-oriented ontology is simply on the other side of all of those uh, arguments. And I want to give some reasons today for why I think that's more useful for ecology than some of the philosophies that are associated more with ecology these days. Um, now, I've said that Latour had to try to destroy the distinction between nature and culture tried to say that the natural and the cultural are simply two kinds of actors we can have. There can be other kinds. There are lots of actors that are what he calls hybrids, where you can't really tell whether they're natural or cultural. Um, so he got rid of that dualism, which I think is good, but he also got rid of another dualism, which I think is not so good, which is that when Latour got rid of the difference between nature and culture, he simultaneously thought he was getting rid of the, the difference between things as they are in themselves and things as they appear to us. He simply thinks those are the same distinctions. I and mean, by getting rid of the first, he's getting rid of the second. And so he actually thinks it is somehow philosophically harmful to accept the idea that a thing might be something outside of its interactions with other things. And this continues in the Tour's thoughts into his recent work on Gaia, his recent work on ecology, which he uh, publicized in his Gifford lectures two years ago. That's coming out as a book uh, I don't think it's already out, but it will be coming out soon in French and English. And one of the conclusions, there are a lot, a lot of things in that series of lectures in Scotland that I agree with, but one of the conclusions of Latour that I do not agree with is his idea that Gaia, the idea of the Earth as an entity that self-regulates, Gaia will not really exist until humans politically take account of it. Somehow Gaia needs to be brought into political communication with all the other fields of human endeavor. But that is precisely not what Lovelock meant by it, of course. Lovelock meant that Gaia is there whether we like it or not. And we simply need to recognize it. So if we don't recognize that our actions are causing lasting damage to Gaia, then we are going to be the victims. And so it's, Lovelock is not saying the same as Latour. Latour is trying to say that we have to politically construct Gaia, whereas Lovelock says it's already there. It's a matter of our recognizing it. All right. Let me just say a little bit about object-oriented ontology before I get into these other ecological discussions, because I can't assume that all of you are familiar with it. Um, <coughs> the wider term is speculative realism, of course, which I won't say a lot about, but speculative realism was the idea that we should be able to talk about the world as it is in itself, or humans as they are in themselves, apart from their interrelation. Uh, previously, philosophy in the continental tradition meant talking only about human and world and their mutual correlation. That you can't talk about the world the way it is apart from how we conceive of it. And this was seen as, as the uh, legacy of Hume and Kant. Kant and Meassou critiqued this with the term he called correlationism. Correlationism is the idea that philosophy can only talk about the human world interaction, cannot talk about humans, cannot talk about worlds. Uh, 
And we all thought, we didn't have much else in common other than a, a passion for H.P. Lovecraft's fiction. Uh, other than that, the only philosophical idea we had in common was this negative idea that we should be able to talk about the world in itself, not just the world as it appears to, to humans. Now, um, most philosophy has been an attempt to get rid of objects. What is an object? When you hear the word object, you might think of that it's the opposite of the human subject, or that an object is a solid, hard thing that is durable through time. Whereas for me, an object is simply anything that is irreducible in either of two directions. One thing is an object is not real unless it's irreducible to its pieces, and the other is that an object is not real unless it's irreducible to its effects. Now, of course, every object has pieces and every object has effects, but the object is the middle ground, the third term between its tinier parts and its larger effects. If you go back to the beginning of Western philosophy in ancient Greece with the pre-Socratic thinkers, all of these thinkers were trying to get rid of objects by talking about a smaller set of components from which all objects are made. So Thales of Miletus began by saying everything's made of water, no matter what it is. There are not really tables or human bodies or buildings. Really, water is what everything is made of. You had uh, Anaximenes who said it was air. Air is actually a better choice than water because it has fewer properties. It's more capable of becoming many different things. You had uh, uh, Empedocles saying it's air, earth, fire, and water mixed by love and hate. And finally, you had the atomists, the only respectable ones today, the ones who say that everything's made out of tiny atomic components that can be mixed together and give rise to different sorts of objects. And then you had another sort of pre-Socratic philosopher who said even all those things are too specific. Ultimately, everything is just this giant homogeneous lump that everything emerges from and passes back into. And variants of these theories still appear today in different contemporary thinkers. But what all these thinkers had in common was the idea that mid-sized objects, large-sized objects, aren't really there. That what you need to do is reduce everything to the tiniest components of which they are made. And that's what knowledge is. Knowledge is about talking about what everything is ultimately made of, the ultimate level of sub-entities from which everything is constructed. Now, what's the problem with these kinds of theories? I think it's pretty clear the problem with these kinds of theories is they cannot explain what we call emergence, which is that not everything in the world is decided at the ultimate super microscopic level. We, we don't even know what that level would be yet. Uh, it's never, it's, people have thought they've discovered it in the past, but it keeps getting decomposed. Even if strings are real, for example, are they really the ultimate stuff of which everything is made, or does a string have even tinier subcomponents? We don't even know if this level exists. Now, you can't, uh, obviously, water has properties that, H, that hydrogen and oxygen alone don't have. Uh, Norway has properties even though, that, that remain somewhat durable, even though people are changing, generations are changing every 15 or 20 years. Construction is going on, on all the time. Buildings are being taken down. The borders might change slightly from century to century. So a, th a thing has a reality that can endure changes in its parts. I've often heard it said that the atoms in your body are recycled every seven years on average. I don't know if there's a valid source for that, but if it's true, it means that everything here in my physical body was not here in 2007, but was in food, in plants, or somewhere else, and my body has incorporated it, gotten rid of the other parts. So emergence simply means that larger level entities than the ultimate one arise out of the smaller components and have a certain durable character that persists to some extent, despite the changes in the parts. And this is what the pre-Socratic philosophies, which I call undermining philosophies, because they undermine mid-sized objects by replacing them, paraphrasing them as tiny little particles, uh, that, they cannot account for that fact of emergence, the fact that Paris remains Paris from one decade to the next, despite all the constant micro and macro changes that are occurring in Paris each year. All right, that's one way in which philosophers have tried to get rid of objects. The other I have given the reverse name of overminers, because they say the exact opposite. Underminers say objects are too shallow to be true. You have to go down deeper than objects, get down to the tiny subobjectual level. Uh, the overminers, who are more familiar to us today, are the ones who say the opposite. They say objects are too deep to be the truth. Everything's really just power, or it's language, or it's imminence, or it's uh, events. You're familiar with a lot of these terms from contemporary philosophy. We don't need any naive idea of an object hiding behind these things. There are no objects hiding behind the world. Everything is just a process, everything is a flux, everything is a flow, and uh, that is the overmining theory. Why? Because as I said in the case of Latour, you cannot really explain change in this way. In order to explain change, you have to accept the idea that something in every entity is held in reserve, that it's not acting now, but that it might act in the future. It doesn't mean the objects exist forever. I'm not giving a Platonistic theory here where everything has an eternal essence. Things can be destroyed, 
It just means that things are not exhausted in each instance by their actions in that instance. That things have a surplus power that they can exert later on, or maybe not. Not all aspects are, of a thing are expressed ever. But you do have some aspects that will be expressed in the future that are not expressed now. Now, usually I found that these two terms are not found in isolation, or these two strategies of thinking are not found in isolation. Reducing a thing to its parts, reducing a thing to its actions. Usually they come together as a pair. They serve as alibis for each other. So an example of this would be mainstream scientific materialism. Because what does mainstream scientific materialism say? Well, it seems to say that everything is explained by what it's made of. That's an undermining move. But then once you get down to that lowest level, it's not a lowest level anymore. It's a highest level because it's claimed that we can know these things in exhaustive mathematical equations. That these things are completely knowable. So we have the lowest level of the tiniest parts of things, and then we have the uppermost level of mathematical exhaustibility of what these things are. So you have both extremes working at once. The thing is tiny and below our perception, but the thing is also up here and we can know it. What gets lost is the middle zone. Latour himself provides another curious example here, because Latour himself, in about 2002 or 3, starts to realize that actor network theory cannot explain change. That if a thing is only what it's doing right now, you can't really explain the change in things, no matter how much he says he wants to talk about change. And he introduces, at least briefly, this solution that he calls the plasma. And the plasma is a lot like this pre-Socratic lump or blob that is indeterminate and that everything springs from it. Latour says, he gives examples. Um, he says, that why did the Soviet Union collapse overnight without warning? Not many people were predicting it. He said the plasma did it. Right? The plasma is this unformatted extra surplus that belongs to the entire world and it causes change to happen. So the plasma did that. The plasma ended the Soviet Union. What about friendships and love affairs that suddenly disintegrate without prior warning? Again, Latour says the plasma is responsible for that. And finally, the best example, the funniest example, why does a mediocre academic musician suddenly compose a brilliant symphony, if that's ever happened? He says the plasma did it. The plasma made this brilliant piece of music be composed. So he's allowing this plasma way too much causal power. It's causing all different places, different kinds of effects. And how do you bridge the gap between one and the other? But he says this plasma is immense. If all networks of all entities are the London undergrounds, the plasma is London as a whole. That's Latour's attempt to dual mind by saying that you have this lowest level of plasma and this uppermost level of, of uh, networks that are completely defined. What's lost, what's sacrificed there is the object in between. Or to give one last example, Tristan Garcia, a young French philosopher to whom I feel very close intellectually. Uh, Garcia says a table, for example, is neither its parts nor its effects, but the difference between its parts and its effects. And he seems to think that that's a compromised solution, but it's actually not. I would consider it doubly dangerous. Because if a, if a table is simply the difference between its components and its effects, that means it's oversensitive to both. Because if you replace one atom in the table, it's no longer the same table. If you move the table a centimeter, it's no longer the same table. So Garcia also loses the idea of objects that have some ability to be moved around or to change a few of their qualities without being completely reborn as a new object. So what O is about, object-oriented ontology, is trying to recognize the properties of the object that do not endure eternally, because you can destroy a table, just as you can kill a horse, as in Aristotle's philosophy. So objects do not last forever, but they do last longer than an instant. They do last long enough to change some of their accidental properties while keeping the real ones. And I made this case in an essay for Documenta three years ago now, uh, called The Third Table. I was talking about uh, Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington, the great English physicist, perhaps best known as the one who verified Einstein's theory of general relativity, which I believe was just proposed 100 years ago yesterday. Or maybe it's today, no, it was yesterday. 100 years ago yesterday, Einstein formulated the equations of the general theory of relativity, explaining gravity in, in non-Newtonian terms. Um, well, what I said about the th Eddington is Eddington was also famous at one time for his, his own Gifford lectures, long before the tours. Eddington said, in a famous preface, that I'm writing my lectures at this table, but it's actually two tables. On the one hand, it's, it's a scientific table. It's the table discussed by the sciences, which is mostly empty space, and electrons are swarming around, and it doesn't look anything like what we, we think it looks like at our scale. That's one table, the one that scientists talk about. The other table, Eddington said, is the practical table. It's the table that has a certain color and that I bought for a certain price, 
but I can move around the room that's hard enough for me to lean on. And Eddington says that these two tables will always be in conflict, but essentially the scientific table is the better one for him. He's a physicist after all. What I claimed in this uh, lecture is that actually there's a third table that's not reducible to either of those. And this is what not only philosophy should be talking about, but what the arts are talking about. Notice that the two kinds of, of tables that Eddington was talking about are the two kinds that I call undermining or overmining. Basically, Eddington was saying you can explain the table in terms of its tiny particles, or you can explain the table in terms of its uses. Those are both forms of knowledge. Any kind of knowledge we have about anything, I can't think of any exceptions to this. Any kind of knowledge is one of those two procedures. If somebody asks you what something is, you can give only two kinds of answers. One is you can tell them what it's made of. Two, you can tell them what it does. Those are the two kinds of knowledge. There's no, I don't believe there's any kind of knowledge that doesn't fit into one of those two baskets. Now, philosophy is, although this is often forgotten, since we've been trying to slavishly imitate the natural sciences and mathematics for the last 400 years of philosophy, philosophy is born as an anti-knowledge enterprise. I'm talking here about Socrates. Socrates who constantly tells us that he knows nothing, that only a god can know anything. He, Socrates who uses the word philosophia, which means a love of wisdom, not a wisdom. It's something you're never getting to, that you're approaching. Uh, Socrates, people sometimes think he's the one who wants definitions for everything. Yes, he is, but he's also the one who never reaches definitions for anything. Socrates is never satisfied with any de definition of love or friendship or justice or beauty that anyone gives in any of Plato's dialogues. So ultimately, this is what philosophy is about. It's a kind of counter-knowledge. Art two, would you want to undermine or overmine an artwork? Would you want to be able to say that this artwork can be explained in terms of the particles of canvas and spray paint of which it's composed? You could do that in some very highly contrived Dadaist scenario, but you're not normally going to do that. Would you want to say that the artwork is nothing more than the effect it has on the viewers here and now? Well, of course not, right? because that's going to change over time. And so the artwork is also somewhere positioned between those two, and the better it resists either of the reductions in either direction, uh, the more aesthetic power it has, the more power it has to interest us for longer amounts of time, and the, more, the harder it is to describe it in terms, or to paraphrase it in prose terms. Uh, knowledge is generally a paraphrase of a thing in prose terms. Knowledge means taking the name of a thing and replacing it with a bunch of verifiable properties. So if you are a, a physicist and you discover the electron, and you name it electron, well, that's only a start, right? You have to replace the name electron with any number of true properties about electrons, however many there are by now. Um, that's what you do. That is not what you do in the arts. Your goal in the arts is not to replace an artwork by a certain number of true propositions about it, and the same is true of a philosophy. You're not trying to replace a philosophy with a number of, of verifiable statements. So this is something that the philosophy and the arts have in common, that they are not forms of knowledge. They have cognitive value without being true prose statements about the way the world really is. And this is what I meant by the third table. And one of the things it implies is that you cannot make direct, accurate statements about the world. You have to make elliptical or indirect or what I call vicarious or elusive statements about the world. You cannot do it directly. Now, there's nothing new about this. We do this all the time. We do this with hints. We do this with innuendo. We do this with metaphor. Uh, much of our communication is not, does not consist of direct prose statements. I'll, I'll give an example here, one of my favorite examples from Daniel Dennett's book, or his essay, sorry, on Quining Qualia. Uh, Dennett is one of the more reductive philosophers working in America today. And there's a really funny passage where Dennett is making fun of wine tasters where he, he uh, imagined some wine taster drinking something and saying, flamboyant and velvety Pinot, but lacking in stamina. And he just says, what a bunch of pretentious garbage. You know, what is that? Instead, you should just pour the wine into a machine, and the machine spits out a chemical formula. That's wine tasting for Dennett. Now, I think we'd all agree that something is lost here. Right? That you, you need the indirect statement of the flamboyant and velvety Pinot. That, that, those can be wrong, those can be pretentious. I hold, however, that pretension is simply the professional risk run in the humanities and the arts. We run the risk of pretension in a way that scientists don't. Natural scientists don't utilize this kind of language because they don't have to. Their project is one of trying to replace the name of a thing with literal properties belonging to the thing. And therefore, precision is everything. The avoidance of bullshit is everything in the sciences. Uh, where that's not the case in the humanities, arts and design, social sciences. Things have to be approached indirectly. You need that wine taster to take that risk, you need the prose style to do a lot of the work for you in a kind of indirect, elusive way. And that's going to get into something that Morton says. 
All right, now let's, let's go back to, the, those are some of the basics of object-oriented ontology. The idea that you cannot reduce a thing in either direction. So there are all these objects existing at mid-level. And incidentally, uh, people sometimes say that uh, this makes triple O, object-oriented ontology, supernatural or mystical. No, it doesn't, because the things themselves for triple O are not hidden in some other world. They're in this world. They're right here. This table is one of them. This computer is one of them. They're just not equivalent to what you think you know about them or what you perceive of them. They're all around us. We ourselves are such objects. They're not in some other worlds. All right. Now let's, let's talk about the Gaia hypothesis a bit of James Lovelock. I think you probably all know a bit about it. So I was just refreshing my memory about it yesterday on the flights. Uh, Lovelock thought that the combination of gases in the Earth's atmosphere, this is in the ninth, early 1960s, combination of gases in our atmosphere are so volatile and so improbable that they must be regulated somehow uh, by life. It must be that the organisms on the Earth are somehow maintaining the Earth's atmosphere in a certain state. And like most good, many good scientific arguments, this one was ridiculed before it was accepted. And Lovelock says most scientists want to work with a bottom-up model where they start with the smallest known organisms, the, the smallest chemicals, the DNA of life on Earth, and work up from that to find out what the Earth itself is. Lovelock says he simply wanted to go in the opposite direction. He said, we should, in, order we, in order to know if a planet has life from far, from far away, uh, the way to do that isn't to go down and dig up soil samples and see what's in the soil samples. The way to do that is to look at the combination of gases in the atmosphere and see if it's far from equilibrium, because nothing can be far from equilibrium for long unless life is somehow involved in it. Well, he also called himself a holist when he was talking about this theory, meaning that everything's holistically interconnected but I want to say that Lovelock is, in fact, not a holist at all. You know, holists should think that everything's connected. A good part of Lovelock's insights are exactly the opposite. Much of what he has to tell us is that not everything is connected. Here's one example. Uh, he, in, the, in the first book on Gaia, Lovelock talks about a hypothetical thermonuclear war that kills off all humans. He says, somewhat grimly, that this, such a nuclear war would probably not have much of an effect on Gaia as a whole at all, because most of the life forms that exist are carpets of bacteria, whether on land or underwater, and many of these could survive such a nuclear war. So it's really a question of human survival that we're talking about with that war. Uh, and if we're holistic, it should be that humans should be able to completely destroy the biosphere as we know it, which we can't, according to Lovelock. Uh, interestingly enough, he's also not a moralist. A lot of times, the discussion of climate change comes with a certain amount of moral vituperation against we humans uh, for having caused this problem in the first place. Uh, whereas Lovelock is always, in some sense, praising pollution. The pollution is a necessary byproduct of the attempt to create organization, to create a non-entropic situation. The, the goal, he says, is to uh, process pollution to make it useful, not to morally rebuke pollution as being a, a disaster. I would say that Lovelock gave the most horrifying lecture that I ever saw in person. I saw him in Dublin in 2009, and I've never been more scared in my life. Um, I think he's modified his views more in a slightly more optimistic direction recently. What he said that day, I'll tell you why it scared me so much. He said, it's already too late. You know, there's one possible thing we can do, which involves burning stuff into charcoal and burying it, but no one's going to do that, so too, too late. Um, he said that by the year 2100, there will be only a billion humans left instead of seven or eight today, whichever it is. I always forget. Um, so only one billion will be left. There'll be, a, what, eight, 75 to 80 percent, 85 percent kill off of humans. Most of the ones left will be living up here in the Arctic Circle, or two very privileged places, Ireland, New Zealand, uh, which have just the right climate to, to survive the big blow that's coming from Gaia. Um, England and Japan would also be okay, except they're, they're already too overpopulated, so they're gonna, a lot of those people are gonna die off. And he also said the Irish are gonna have to kill a lot of people, because everyone's gonna be trying to get into Ireland. You know, New Zealand's too far away from most people, so a lot of people are gonna be getting, coming in. Someone jokingly asked if they're gonna need nuclear weapons, and he said, you're gonna need some kind of weapons. Um, so uh, the reason he thought that the game was already over is because three things are going to happen, Let's see if I remember them correctly. Uh, first of all, the algae is going to die off, and that's going to eliminate one of the most important CO2 removal sources we have. Then the rainforests are gonna die off, which is gonna be the same thing, right? I, no, I, I forgot the very first step, which is the ice caps are gonna melt which means a lot of the sun, solar radiation isn't going to be bounced off the Earth that's going to be here. That's going to kill the algae. Uh, 
and then the, after the algae die, the rainforests are all going to die. And then the final step is that the permafrost in Canada and Siberia is going to be melted and all the dead biological stuff is going to be releasing CO2, the dead mastodons and all the old plant life and stuff. And so it's pretty much too late in that lecture. Uh, and, and with typical understated British wit, he said, the next century is going to be a hard school for humanity. Uh, which, it's a nice way to put it. Well, um, apparently in the last couple of years, he's moderated this a bit because the, the heating statistics of the globe weren't quite as bad as he thought they would be in the last, since 2009. So he's, now he's, he's being a little more jovial about our chances. But still, he, still we're headed for bad times ahead, according to Lovelock. Now, the interesting th thing here is that you'll see, once again, Lovelock is not a holist. Lovelock is not saying everything affects everything else, which is the way sometimes ecology is, is taught to people or spread as a mantra. What he's saying is that there are three or four specific mechanisms we have to watch out for. Some of the stuff we do is not going to devastatingly affect the climate. It's not the case that every human action is a guilty one. There are simply these problems, the particular problems that we have with the melting of the, the polar caps, the death of the algae, the death of the rainforest, and the melting of the permafrost. There are specific mechanisms that at a certain point are going to run away and no longer, be, no longer can we do anything with them. I went to, just as a side note, shortly after I saw this lecture, Atlantic Magazine published an article claiming that the problem with global warming is that it might be too easy to fix. I don't know if any of you saw this. And the, the, there were lots of different ideas people had to fix it. But the, probably the most plausible one you know this idea that volcanoes, by emitting sulfur dioxide, can reverse global warming. With Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines, supposedly reversed global warming, but I don't, I don't remember how many years it was, five or six years, global warming actually reversed, just because of one volcano. Now, we can't make volcanoes erupt, but we can put up zeppelins in the air and start spraying out sulfur dioxide. And this would be very good for some countries, right? It would be very good for Bangladesh, very good for the Netherlands. But what if you're Australia, and you're just getting a bigger ozone hole from this, because sulfur dioxide actually increases the ozone hole, even as it decreases the temperature. Could you have a war between countries over whether or not this sulfur dioxide should be getting sprayed out of the Zeppelins? But anyway, that was just a bit about Gaia. Now let's talk about the Anthropocene, a term that has come out of geology and climate science in recent years. It wasn't coined that long ago. And there's you know, some debate about whether this is a real geological era, and, and very real debate about when it started. You know, some will say it started only with the atomic bomb, some with the Industrial Revolution, some all the way back to um, the Iron Age, I guess. So there's, there's still a lot of dispute about this. When did humans begin to make an Anthropocene climate? It's not clear. But philosophically, I plan to steal this term, simply steal it from climate science and use it for philosophy uh, for reasons I'm going to try to explain here. Here's one of the debates we have now in philosophy. You've got someone like Jane Bennett, who I'm pretty close to philosophically, uh, who, who wants very badly to break down the border between nature and culture, just as Latour did. And when you do this, you inevitably have to use a lot of metaphoric anthropomorphic language, right? You end up having to say things, like Latour says, objects negotiate with each other, actors negotiate. And then some killjoys will come in and say, wait a minute, how can objects negotiate? They don't have minds. You know, how, how can an apricot negotiate with a truck? They're not thinking things. These, these are the typical criticisms you usually hear against Latour and others who allow Inanimate objects have agency, right? And I'm guessing that most people in this room don't have as big a problem with that as some other people. So this, this is the danger of anthropomorphism. I don't think it's that dangerous because it's simply metaphorical language designed to break us out of our anthropocentric slumber. And Jane Bennett even says something like, sometimes some anthropomorphism is needed to fight anthropocentrism. Okay, I, I'm closer to that side too, as is Tim Morton. But then you get another contemporary philosopher like Quentin Mersou, a very good one, who takes exactly the opposite tack and says, wait a minute, you know, how are you using all these human metaphors to talk about non-human things? How do you know that none, why are you using human terms to talk about non-human things? So Mayasu embraces the anthropocentrism, as does Badiou, as does Zizek, as do some other contemporary philosophers. Now it seems to me that Anthropocene doesn't fit uh, under either of these headings. And someone was saying the same thing in the, in the geologic imagination. I don't remember whether it was you in your preface or Morton in his essay, but somebody made the same point very well that the Anthropocene is not something you can call anthropomorphic or anthropocentric, because why? Well, humans did create it, and yet humans have not mastered it. We are an ingredient of the Anthropocene, and yet we are not in control of it. And so it's neither something in human, under human control or completely outside of human control. It's somewhere in between. 
And so the Anthropocene is an interesting term for that reason. And recently I've been interested in this term in connection with arts, and let me talk about that as one small uh, excursion here on the side. Uh, since I'm generally considered a speculative realist, and speculative realists are known for wanting to reduce the amount of, uh, reduce the human role in philosophy and bring in the role, increase the role of non-humans, people often mistakenly think that I want to get rid of humans. They think I want to kill humans or that I hope for the extermination of humans or something like that. I'm apocalyptic or something like that. that. That's true of some speculative realists, I think. For example, Brassier, Brassier seems to think, he says we're already dead or something like that. I'm not sure what that means, but he says that because the universe is inevitably going to die, we're already dead. All of our actions are doomed to pass away without a trace, so we're already dead. Now, that's apocalyptic. Uh, I wouldn't say anything like that. Even Norcha Morris in the interview that I already did of her in that uh, same collection seems to think that we're all apocalyptic thinkers who don't want any human stuff involved. That's certainly not true in my case. I think that uh, somebody, somebody came up to me a few years ago and said, what would art without humans look like? And I was kind of stumped by that question at first. And I, my first instinct was, oh, I have to provide an answer to this question. How can you, how can you? Then I realized I don't want an art without humans. Why would I, who would want an art without humans? Who would want a chess without humans or a basketball without humans? There are some, or human politics without humans. There are some objects of which humans are necessarily an ingredient. And I would say that art is one of them. I, don't, I wouldn't think much of an aesthetic world where humans weren't involved in some way. One of the early reactions to speculative realism by an artist, which was very clever, was Joanna Malinowska's piece uh, where she marched, I don't know if it was from New York or somewhere in Canada, as far to the, towards the North Pole as she could go in Canada, carrying only a solar-powered boombox playing uh, Glenn, Glenn Gould playing Bach fugues. And then she marched as close as she could to the North Pole and put it there and went back. And I think her idea was, right now, somewhere, until global warming melts this ice shelf and the boombox falls to the floor of the sea, there is Bach music playing somewhere that no one's hearing, and that's an art without humans. Funny idea, very interesting idea. I think it's probably too literal, uh, an interpretation of art, what art looks like in the post-anthropocentric age. Uh, because I want to distinguish between two roles that humans play with respect to the world. On the one hand, humans are observers of the world. Humans look at the world, they make statements about it, they make philosophies, they make sciences, they make artworks. Humans are observers of the world. And it is true that one of the central ideas on which Triple O is based is the idea that the world is always more than what humans perceive or think about it. Right? The world is always a surplus. The this is what I think Morton really means by dark ecology. There's a, the darkness there means we can't get to the things. Everything withdraws to some extent. All right, that's one way in which humans function. And I would agree, I want to... I de-emphasize the human in that sense, because I think all of our knowledge comes up short, all of our practical activity comes up short, the world is always somewhat mysterious to us. But there's another sense of humans that I don't think we need to get rid of. Right? Humans are also ingredients of the world. So I would say this about art. Uh, art has to be deeper than what humans think they can know about it, or how human, what, what the human first reaction is to an artwork. There has to be some depth there, some aesthetic depth to the artwork for it to be interesting. But it does not follow that humans should not be involved with the artwork at all. And it does not follow that you have to get rid of humans. You have to kill humans or banish them from the gallery or from the art site for it to be a real artwork. Humans can and should be involved. They, they just have to be involved in such a way that they cannot exhaustively paraphrase what the artwork is doing. And this gets a bit into the ongoing argument over Michael Fried's famous essay in, the 19, in 1967, Arts and Object to It. And first of all, Fried uses objects in the exact opposite way from how I use it. Freed is there criticizing the minimalist artists. What do minimalists do, he says? The two, they do two things that are wrong, but he, he thinks that they're the same. One of them is that they're literalists, because he thinks the minimalists just put cubes in front of you, or pyramids, or racks on the wall, or whatever it is. There's, what you see is what you get. There's nothing more to it than that. And for Freed, that cannot be art. There's no depth to it. It's just it's simply an object right there in front of you, a literal object. And Freed also says, that this is a theatrical situation, which is bad for him, because uh, precisely because the minimalists are simply producing literal objects, nothing interesting can happen on the side of the object. Everything interesting must be happening on the side of your theatrical reaction to the artwork. And he thinks this is the worst possible thing that can happen. Freed hates the theatrical conception of art. Now, I think Freed there, however, is confusing two different things that are going on. 
One of the things that's going on is that minimalism, if you agree with his critique of minimalism, I'm not saying I do, but if you agree with his critique, minimalism is simply creating objects that are simply there, they're all legible on the surface, there's nothing more to them than what you see, and that goes with the human role as an observer, which I agree with Freed should be de-emphasized in art. The idea that the artwork is simply however it appears to us. But by getting rid of the theatrical, he's trying to get rid of the idea of the human as an ingredient or a participant in the art. And so if Freed were to respond to, say, Nicolas Borio's Relational Aesthetics, that, that very influential book in the arts, where Borio favors artists who want to do things like put soup in a gallery and encourage people to cook the soup together and have a conversation and thereby destroy the anonymity of consumer society, or whatever it's supposed to do. There's nothing in my conception of art, at least, that would rule that out. I have no problem with humans being involved in art. And so Borio wrote a fairly negative piece about me in some art magazine recently, and I responded that actually I like what he's doing. I have nothing against the idea that there could be human interaction with art. I just am against the idea that the artwork is nothing more than its political effect or nothing more than how it seems to any given observer and so forth. So I would say that there is no art without humans, and this means that art is always Anthropocene. Just as chess has always been Anthropocene, human politics has always been Anthropocene because humans have always been a necessary ingredient of these things. Uh, perhaps language has always been Anthropocene, at least language in the human form. Now, uh, the climate is just now becoming Anthropocene, perhaps, or maybe it happened back in the Iron Age and we're just noticing it now. We are entering an age where the climate is becoming Anthropocene, although many other objects have always been Anthropocene, but not all objects. And this is where I think Latour slips up. Latour seems to think that all objects are Anthropocene to the extent that he thinks that Gaia only exists once it's been woven into our our conception of the world. Until that, it's not really there. Whereas for Lovelock, the whole point was it is there, and we're just too stupid to realize it yet, and it's almost too late. All right. Now, Morton's hyperobjects are talking about uh, objects that are so vast in temporal or spatial scale that they far outstrip any human interaction with them. And of course, the climate gets us into plenty of places where that concept is applicable. Uh, not only the fact that climate changes might take place over very long periods of time, but the fact that cities can exist that far outlast the normal human lifespan or far outlast the lifespan of a given civilization. And Morton, in uh, the Hyperobjects book, which I hope you've all read or, or will read, uh, gives a number of properties of the hyperobject. I'll just tell you a few of them here that are important to me. One of them is the viscosity of hyperobjects. The idea that people become intertwined with them. People can't separate themselves from the hyperobjects. So we can all separate ourselves from an annoying person or a city that we don't like anymore, but we cannot separate ourselves from the climate, obviously, or from the, the galaxy. He also says that hyperobjects are non-local because no local manifestation of a hyperobject fully does the job of telling us what it is. So it happened to me again about four days ago when the snowstorm started in Dubuque, Iowa, where I live these days. Snow flakes are falling as I'm walking to the supermarket and this man turns to me with the usual banal joke, you know, I thought we were supposed to have global warming, ha ha. Well, of course, you know, you obviously can't pin down whether global warming is happening or not based on the specific weather in one tiny Iowa town in one day. And the other one that's <coughs> perhaps the most important for Triple O is, is Morton's concept of interobjectivity. Interobjectivity means that object-object interactions are just as important as human-object interactions. And when we're talking about hyperobjects, we're talking about objects that might be so large and vast that they can be exerting a pull on each other without humans being involved, such as the way that the Earth is probably getting closer to the sun over time um, as the force of our uh, orbit around the sun is being progressively weakened. Uh, even Immanuel Kant thought that the tides uh, each day are slowing down the Earth's rotation gradually. I'm not sure if that's a scientific truth recognized these days, but Kant gave a proof for it at the time. Um, all of these things are properties of hyperobjects that you don't, generally, you don't always find when humans are involved. And of course, for, for Morton, and I agree with this, when you're talking about interobjectivity, you're talking about an aesthetic effect between objects, and I'll get to that at the end of my talk today. Now, let me say something now about viscosity, though. Another word for viscosity would be entanglement. If, if things are viscous in their relation to each other, they're also entangled. And I mean this here in Ian Hodder's sense rather than in Karen Barad's, because Karen Barad, if you read um, uh, 
Meeting the Universe Halfway, which is one of the excellent theoretical books produced in the last 20 years, uh, really has formed a school of thought. Uh, Barad gets her sense of entanglement from quantum theory, and specifically from Niels Bohr, uh, in the sense that, that Barad is an anti-realist, and she thinks that the world and, and the human mind are entangled in the sense that they co-produce each other, which isn't quite a thesis that Triple O can accept because it has a kind of idealist ring to it. Right? It's the idea that there's no reality outside the mind's interaction with reality, and Zizek leans in this direction a lot, too, when he talks about quantum theory. Whereas all Jan Hatter means is that there's an entanglement, and it's sometimes unidirectional. It's not mutual. Quantum theory, if you read it the way Barad does, means that the world and the mind are co-constituting each other all the time. Whereas for Ian Hodder, who's an archaeologist, one of the more prominent archaeologists these days, uh, generally thinks it's one direction. Right? So for example, he, he says that humans are entangled with Christmas lights now. Why? Because Christmas lights are probably an environmental disaster. Right? They're using up all this electricity. They end up in dumps. We don't really need them, right? If we all agreed with each other, we're not going to use them anymore. We could probably find some suitable way to celebrate Christmas nonetheless without degrading the environment. And yet, there is a whole infrastructure of human employees uh, who are involved in maintaining the existence of, of Christmas lights. There is a recycling business for this in China, which is quite large. Uh, there are shippers who ship used Christmas lights to dumps, presumably. And so that's a kind of entanglement that locks us in a certain path dependence and makes it difficult for us to reverse course. Uh, that's what Hatter means by entanglement. Now, what's interesting about this is that Latour and A&T more generally cannot really account for entanglements. And I want to say something about this. Uh, I love actor network theory. As I've said, I think it's the most important philosophical method in the past century, at least since phenomenology. One of the weaknesses of, of uh, there's, I think there are several weaknesses of ANT. One of the weaknesses, I think, is it reduces things to their actions. It also is probably going a bit too far in viewing all relations as reversible. You know, whereas many theorists in the humanities talk a lot about power, and somebody has power over somebody else, and somebody's oppressing somebody else, you, you'll remember there's not a lot of talk about that in actor network theory. And it's not because Latour doesn't care about oppression. It's because his philosophical method is about reversibility. So he will say there is no such thing as an all-powerful actor. Capitalism, for example. Latour thinks capitalism is simply a, a vast network built out of lots of small things that come together, and you should be able to reverse it if you apply pressure in just the right places. Uh, strong, apparently strong actors for Latour are simply weak actors. Right? That, uh, I remember his essay after 9-11 was about how the United States is actually fragile, and this, is, this event is what shows us that. The supposed superpower is actually a fragile entity just like any other. Now, um, I think most people have a sense that this is not one of the points on which ANT is the most politically useful. It has a hard time talking about relations that are not really symmetrical, where one actor is a lot stronger than another. Whereas I've said that Hodder already gives an example with the Christmas lights. That yes, in principle, humans could decide to abandon Christmas lights, but in practice, it's very difficult to do this. Um, there is a kind of asymmetry. That's one uh, problem I see with ANT. Another problem I see with ANT I've already said, is the idea that all, the implicit idea that all events are equally important, right? Because for Latour, just as for Whitehead, his philosophical hero, anything that happens, since a thing is defined by its relations, any change in your relations is just as important as any other changes. If I move 10 feet to the left or if I kill myself, those are in principle equivalent from an ANT perspective. I don't want to make it sound ridiculous, but that's, in, in principle, those are equivalent because both of them change my relations to other parts of the network. Even though my moving 10 centimeters to the left is not very important, for ANT, it should look just as important as an apparently dramatic event. And that's also something that seems intuitively unsatisfying about ANT. And a thinker who I've found very useful here, and she is very connected to Lovelock since they collaborated for a long time, that's Lynn Margulis. And I would add Lovelock and Margulis to the reading list. Somebody asked me to make suggestions to add to the dark ecology reading list. Uh, Lovelock and especially Margulis would be very high on my list. What, how does Margulis help us philosophically? Well, first, how does she help us biologically? In the 60s, of course, Margulis uh, proposed the theory, the serial endosymbiosis theory, the idea that the cells that exist in such places as our body were formed from symbioses between originally independent organisms. And there's some interesting anecdotes surrounding this. One of the stories is that when she began her, her career as a junior researcher and asked somebody, very interestingly, have we ever seen evolution happen in the laboratory? 
And somebody said, there's one case, and it involved fruit flies. And it involved putting all these fruit flies in a tank and splitting it down the half. So you have two sets of fruit flies. Then one side of the tank, is, the temperature is slowly raised. The other side of the tank, temperature is slowly lowered until after however many months, the fruit flies can no longer interbreed. So you can think of them as separate species now. And they killed and dissected the poor fruit flies, as they always do. And somebody said, wait a minute, the experiment's contaminated. One of the fruit flies picked up a virus. The hot fruit flies picked up a virus. Uh, and so therefore, we can't really accept the results of this experiment. We have to redo it. And Margulis said, that's precisely the point. The fact that the hot fruit flies assimilated the virus shows what's really going on. The reason these fruit flies can survive in the heat is because they formed a symbiosis with this virus and began reproducing it. And as she sees it, this goes all the way back in time to when the Earth's atmosphere started becoming more heavily oxygenated, which would be very toxic for the anaerobic bacteria, and so they needed a symbiosis with these viruses and other small creatures in order to survive the oxygen. And she even made a, as all scientists are supposed to, she made a proposal for testing this hypothesis. The proposal back in the 60s was if you analyze the DNA in the nucleus of these complex cells that we have now, you should find that the DNA does not code for all the organelles in the cell, which means it's not the DNA of the cell that creates all these cell parts, but that they are originally independent organisms that simply reproduce along with the cell. And then in the 80s, they found evidence for this. And so now Margulis's theory, as I understand, is textbook biology. It's no longer a black sheep theory or anything really shocking. It's textbook biology. Now, what could ANT learn from this? Well, one of the things that ANT could learn from this is that not all relations are equally important. Some of the things that happen to you are accidental. It's not true that we're a constant flux and I am many and it's, you have to talk about the lives of Michel Foucault instead of the life of Michel Foucault because everything's pluralistic and everything's in becoming. These are some of the intellectual fashions of the last two decades and I think they're missing a very important point, which is that not all changes are equally important. Some changes mean nothing to you, some changes mean everything to you. And I had an interesting argument about this with Levi Bryant, who's more of a Deleuzian, I'm more of a Heideggerian, and uh, Levi Bryant was trying to claim that uh, I, unless I agreed that everything's in this kind of constant flux of becoming, then I can never really, really explain change except as a combination between two things. And after thinking about that for a while, I don't see the problem with that. Because if you think about your own life, for example, or think about anybody's life, are you really the same person from, from birth to death, or even conception to death? That's probably, in some way, yes, but it's probably stretching it a bit. You're a lot different now from when you were three years old, and you couldn't really say that everything you are now was implicit already in the germ of what you were when you were three years old. But neither could you say that you're constantly in flux, and you're constantly changing, and you are many. That's overstating the case. What really happens in your life, in most lives, is you go through five or six big changes, let's say. You, if you towards the end of your years, reflect on your life and try to do a little history of it, you'll probably find room for five or six chapters. Those are probably going to be the jumps that happened in your life, phases. And where do those phases come from? It's very unlikely that those phases in your life come from sitting in your bedroom and brooding about your life and trying to find yourself. That never works. It's usually from the outside. It's usually a symbiosis. It's usually your meeting with a person, an institution, a profession, a favorite author, a formative experience that changes how you see everything, a special place, the disappearance of somebody who meant a lot to you, the appearance of somebody who means a lot to you, all these things happen in a fairly small number. Maybe there's 10 if, if you have a very active life, a very eventful life. But it's going to be a finite number. And what, does, what usually is involved here? Usually it involves some kind of combination between you and some other entity that has a, a retroactive effect on you and maybe a retroactive effect on the other entity as well, so that it's irreversible. So that you meet a person and maybe that person drifts out of your life 10 years later, but you're not quite the same as before they came into it. Um, or you change professions, but you're not quite the same after having worked in the slaughterhouse for 20 years than you were before, or whatever, whatever that profession might be. So um, uh, this is something that ANT can't really do for us because ANT sees every interaction between any two things at any moment is being potentially very important and is being exhaustively determinative of the two entities in the relation. That's one problem. All right. Um, let me say something about politics here, since I did write a book about Latour's politics last year. And are we doing okay on time, Ari? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I'm on the last page here of, of thoughts. Politics. 
politics is a topic that's often thrown at Triple O. Like either Triple O doesn't have a politics, or people say it's a neoliberal politics, which isn't true, nor is it true that we don't have a politics. Normally, the people who make this charge have some off-the-shelf politics that they picked up from somewhere else and that they regard as already true, whether it's cultural Marxism or it's... Uh, that, that's usually the one that attacks us, actually. People like Alex Galloway and, and uh, Andrew Cole. Now, uh, when, when I started looking at Latour's politics for writing that book, Bruno Latour reassembling the political, I wasn't really sure what his politics were, and I wasn't really sure what my politics were. Uh, I didn't think Latour was really clear what his politics were. And so when, when the publisher wrote to me and said, who should write the book about Latour's politics, I insisted on doing it myself because I was panicking about the topic. I didn't really know. And panic is a good thing to embrace when you want to get new ideas, because you, you have to come up with the ideas or you fail badly. So I agreed to write this book. Started researching it a lot. Well, it turns out that what Latour really is, if you look at his career, is he's a Hobbesian. Thomas Hobbes is perhaps an even bigger influence on Latour than Whitehead was. And you can say a lot of things about Hobbes, uh, but what's the most important thing about Hobbes philosophically? The most important thing about Hobbes is he is the ultimate believer in imminence. Very fashionable word today. Hobbes does not believe in any transcendent authority for anything. His whole point is that he wants the state to be the final authority on everything because that's the only way you can stop civil war, according to Hobbes. If someone thinks they have access to a higher truth than the Leviathan, they're going to cause trouble. And usually this is talked about in terms of religion, right? That if some religious group thinks they have direct access to what God wants, Obviously, they will think they can disobey the state, and this is going to create civil war. It's going to turn us back to the time when, when life was nasty, brutish, and short. And so it's better to have the state in control, no matter, no matter how horribly dictatorial it is, you at least have some stability and so forth. All right, that's true about Hobbes. But one thing that is forgotten about Hobbes is that the same is true for him about science. He also does not want science to have a transcendent authority or any kind of knowledge, right? Because if you have someone who claims scientific access to the truth, they can, again, speak out against the authority of the state and might cause trouble as well. They might cause uh, civil war. So Galileo, for example. I can imagine Hobbes siding with the Catholic Church against Galileo for that very reason. Uh, because you've got somebody who's stating a truth that the, the civil authority is not accepted, and also the spiritual authority, but also the civil authority is not accepted, and this could cause trouble. Well, this seems to have been Latour's political philosophy for the first 15 or so years of his career. Uh, a lot of this, you have to go back and look at some obscure articles by Latour that people don't usually read anymore. That's where his politics is really spelled out in detail, where he's saying that uh, power, Hobbes and Machiavelli are his heroes politically back then. You can't have anyone claiming to have access to direct truth, whether scientifically or religiously or anything else, outside of the interplay of actors with the state being the final decider. Now, this changed, however, in, I would say, 1991, when he published We Have Never Been Modern. Because you might remember there, at the beginning of the book, he is arguing with Shapin and Schaefer, who wrote the famous book on Boyle and Hobbes. And, of course, Boyle thinks you can gain direct access to the truth through experimental science. Boyle is the father of the modern scientific article, um, father of modern experimental science in general, and uh, Hobbes not only does Hobbes not like Boyle doing that, Hobbes actually reported Boyle to the secret police in England as a threat to society for doing this scientific work on vacuums. So Hobbes actually denounced him. Now, Shapin and Schaefer start, end the book by saying Hobbes was right because what counts as good science is, is determined by the standards of society. So therefore, society here is here and science is here. And a lot of science studies still says something very much like that. Uh, that, that society somehow embraces science. Science is just part of society. Society is the ultimate authority. In 1991, I would say, is the year when Latour turned against that. Latour turns against it saying Hobbes was wrong. How could Hobbes be right? If we're going to deconstruct knowledge and science, we also have to deconstruct power. Power can't simply be taken as an obvious fact. Right? So he finally gives up his Hobbesianism then, and he starts looking at politics more is something that's uncertain or unclear. What is, what is the political truth? He goes through this phase in the 90s and early, early 21st century when he thinks this is how we should look at politics. It's something that's never quite clear. And Norcha Maris, who some of you know, especially the ones from Amsterdam, uh, was, was, Latour was one of her dissertation advisors and had a big influence on him here. Um, Maris revived uh, 
the debate between John Dewey and Walter Libman. And John Dewey, of course, is still very famous, being one of the most, one of the greatest American philosophers and one of the leading philosophers of education. Libman is less known today, but he was one of the world's most famous journalists back in the 1920s and 30s. And Libman, Libman suggested in some publications that American democracy is basically a fraud. Why? Well, because the, the ideology of America is that we're, we're ruling ourselves, and so therefore we should all be educated so that we can make wise decisions for the public as a whole. Uh, and that's why strong public education is needed, and so on and so forth. The, the uh, hypocrisy there is, of course, we don't really have educated voters any more than anyone else, and in some cases less. We only have 50% of the people, if we're lucky, 50% of the people voting. We have plenty of stupid people voting who have not bothered to educate themselves at all. Uh, and so Libman concludes that in the future, America needs to be run by technocrats because people simply aren't educated enough to handle the complicated modern society. Right, well, that sounds like kind of a despairing notion, but Dewey, although being very inspired by Libman, says Libman has it part right but part wrong. The point is, not everyone needs to be educated about every issue. A public is created ad hoc around each individual issue that arises, and this is what Norch's uh, dissertation work was about, and a lot of her publications since then have been about, that uh, no issue is no public, as she puts it. And Latour fell under the sway of this for quite a while, maybe 10 years or so, that the idea that uh, politics is actually the realm of non-knowledge, right? that politics isn't something where we should apply a knowledge and try to create uh, a more rational politics. This is actually dangerous. And not for conservative reasons for Latour, but simply because we don't really know what the political truth is. And I talked, incidentally, in this book about the difference between what I call truth politics and power politics. What's the major framework for political discussion since the French Revolution? Well, it's left versus right, of course. Every time we hear a policy, we, we sort of try to gauge subconsciously, where it, or even consciously, where it fits on the left-right spectrum, how close it is to us, if it's too far in one direction or the other for us. Um, but left versus right is not really the main distinction in modern political theory. The main distinction is the distinction between truth and power politics, both of which cross the left-right divide. Truth politics is the idea that there is some political truth uh, that's concealed from us, either by the corrupt interests of certain social classes, or by ideology, or by um, the need to protect ourselves from the foolish masses. So you know, an obvious example of this would be Rousseau. What does Rousseau think about what we were like before? Uh, civil society formed, well, we were actually very natu naturally good, we were sweet to each other, we helped each other, we were equal. This is, the, this is where the left versions of truth politics come from. But then you have the right versions of truth politics that come from Straussianism, more influential in the United States than in Europe these days, I think, uh, which is the idea that the political truth is, well, Straussianism is more complicated than this, but many times it boils down to the idea that the truth is known, and the truth is that there's an eternal hierarchy of human types, and you better make sure that the best people are in charge and not the, the stupid people. So uh, you find this idea in a lot of Straussian authors. These are both forms of truth politics, the idea that we already know the truth, and if we could just get things right, this, this political truth could be incarnated and embodied, and all of our problems would be solved, more or less, whether through revolution or through an aristocratic hierarchy with the philosophers being the kings. Then you get the power politics side, which simply says the reverse, which is that there is no truth in politics. Politics is simply about beating other people by winning, and that everyone's beliefs are equally false, but whoever wins gets to impose theirs over the other. Another modern version of politics. And for a long time, Latour was, seemed very aware that neither of those was going to work. He started off as a power politician in his Hobbesian phase, and then he recoiled from that in 1991. And I'm getting into all of this because Latour has now emerged as an ecological thinker, and he's applying some politics to this. Because uh, what you'll find now is that people like Norch and Morris and others who applauded Latour's move in that other direction are now a little bit worried about where his politics has gone in the Gaia lectures, the Gifford lectures, because Latour there is, is bringing Carl Schmitt a lot into the discussion. Okay, Carl Schmitt. What can we say about Carl Schmitt? He was a Nazi. Uh, doesn't seem to be punished as much for that as Heidegger does. I've never quite understood why. Heidegger's the one who keeps getting raked over the coals for being a Nazi. Not so much Schmidt. He seems to be forgiven a little more somehow. Um, and of course, Schmidt, you know, Schmidt has always been popular on the left as well. That's one difference between him and other Nazis. It's because Schmidt recognizes the character of violence at the bottom of all politics, and many leftists find that refreshingly honest. Now, why does Latour bring in Schmidt? 
I call Latour the first green Schmidian. It's kind of a funny term that seems illogical. Why is Latour the first green Schmidian? Because he seems to have reached a point where he thinks we no longer want a discussion with climate change skeptics. He says, we've argued with them long enough. We now simply need to beat them. It's time for war. And I don't think he means physical violence, but he means we simply need to beat them. Because as far as he's concerned, the evidence for climate change, for global warming, is, is sufficient. We don't want to keep arguing ad infinitum with these people. And Schmidt, of course, uh, is a leading theorist of this state of exception, which is the real moment of politics for him, when you can no longer reason thing, things out, and it's simply a question of existential survival. Who's going to survive here, the climate change warriors or the climate change skeptics? And this is actually more important in politics than we tend to realize. We tend to think of politics a lot in moral terms these days. We tend to perhaps over-identify politics and morality. And in some ways, that's a, that's a noble sentiment. But in another, in another sense, it misses the point in some conflicts. And I'll give you the example of Egypt, where I'm, I'm still teaching, despite not living there. This is my 16th year on the faculty in Egypt. And one of the most interesting political conflicts in the world is the conflict between Egypt and its sub-Saharan neighbors over Nile River water rights. And this is a bit suppressed right now, but it's going to erupt again and again in the future and could lead to wars. What this, what this comes from is that back in the 1940s, I think it was, a treaty was signed between Egypt, Sudan, say Ethiopia, Kenya, probably a few other countries, regarding who gets which share of the Nile water. And Egypt got a pretty high share. I've forgotten the exact share. And in the 70s, these arguments flared up again. And Egypt's go-to argument, of course, is we've got the treaty. Just look at this treaty. Look what it says. We get this percent that's the highest out of all the countries on the Nile. And the other countries responded by saying, yeah, but that was signed under British imperialism. We didn't really have the option not to sign it. The British really guided this whole thing. So we want to, be, we want to reopen this as independent sovereign actors now. And Egypt responds, yeah, but we're a desert country. Right? We, we're 98% desert. You all get rain. You all have mountains and springs and things like this. Egypt is the biggest country on the Nile, and it also has the least water. It's almost arid. And the, the sub-Saharan countries respond by saying, yeah, but you're terribly inefficient irrigators. You waste so much water irrigating. And Egypt says, yeah, but so do you. You're also very inefficient at this. Well, this is an interminable argument. You're never going to reach a point in the argument where you see that it's been rationally settled. There's plenty of evidence on both sides for this. Sooner or later, you're going to get to a point where the water situation becomes bad enough that there could easily be a war between some of these countries. And if that happens, it wouldn't be a very good reaction to sit on the sidelines and say, oh, all these petty people who can't solve their problems except by force. In that case, force would not be petty. Force would be the last ditch way to survive for all of these countries, perhaps, under certain circumstances. And so Schmidt perhaps is more honest about this kind of situation than other political theorists who do tend to, some of them do tend to think that all conflicts are petty and that violence is always a, a failure. And so the tour is bringing this back in. Now, what's the real difference between Hobbes and Schmidt? Because they're very similar. Hobbes and Schmidt both talk about a very negative political landscape where things are decided by force and violence. There is a big difference. That difference is that Hobbes is horrified by the state of nature and wants to end it, right? Hobbes thinks we're better under any dictator than we are when we're in the state of nature, where we're just murdering each other and stealing from each other. Uh, any dictator is better than that for Hobbes. But we don't really need the dictator because we can establish bourgeois liberal democracy, which means uh, we are not faced with political violence on a daily basis, and instead our lives are redefined as freedom of choice in the economic sense. And this is very unfashionable these days because of the attacks on liberalism and neoliberalism and so forth. Whereas Schmidt, interestingly enough, turns the whole thing upside down. Schmidt wants us back in the state of nature, more or less. Right? Schmidt, uh, Schmidt agrees with Hegel. Hegel said, who is the bourgeois? The bourgeois is someone who does not want to engage in political violence. The person who wants to avoid political violence at all costs. That's, that's what the bourgeois liberal is. And in some ways, being a bourgeois liberal may sound more appealing than what Schmidt wants, which is that we're going to be radical activists, potentially violent activists, for our cause. Um, you find people on the left and the right who go either way on that question. All right, so I talked a lot about Latour's politics in an effort to get back into Schmidt and climate politics. Latour's climate politics, again, I've criticized for two, on two grounds. One of those grounds being that Latour seems to think that Gaia does not exist, 
until we politically incorporate it in our world, which I think is a big mistake. Uh, and also Latour sees politics as being a situation where we already need to abandon discussion and we need to simply have an existential struggle for survival with climate change skeptics. I want to say one more thing about politics before I close here, and this will be deliberately provocative, and this comes out of Morton, actually. I mentioned that interobjectivity was one of Morton's uh, concepts that he derived from dark ecology. The idea that objects interact with each other as well as interacting with us. And there aren't that, by the way, there aren't that many places in the tour where he talks about human object interactions. It's usually, there's usually, I mean, where there, I'm sorry, where he talks about object object interactions. It's usually about humans inter interacting with objects. There are a few places in the tour's books where you can find talk about two objects smashing into each other with no humans nearby. Latour, uh, I'm sorry, Morton thinks that's essential, as do I. And for Triple O, it's object object interactions are an important part of politics as well, not of human politics maybe, but important part of politics and philosophy. But another aspect of interobjectivity for Morton is that it's somewhat aesthetic. Not somewhat aesthetic, but aesthetic to the core, I should say. I mentioned earlier that uh, if you look at the object as somehow inaccessible, somehow withdrawn, as Tripolo does, this means you can never get at the object directly. There's always an indirect way of getting at the object, an indirect way of representing it, whether metaphorically, elusively, or by innuendo or something like that. But the same holds for object-object interactions for Tripolo. Objects themselves cannot touch each other directly any more than uh, humans can touch objects. And what this means is that the contact between objects is indirect as well. Inanimate objects, when they smash into each other, are interacting indirectly, not any more directly than anything else. And this may sound crazy, except that it has a long history in the history of philosophy. And I think it's at the core of Western philosophy, though it comes from Islam. There's a concept known as occasionalism. Occasionalism. The word occasion at the beginning. This came originally from Islamic philosophy. Very early on. I think it's the most important contribution of Islamic thought to Western philosophy. Uh, this was the idea. There was a, there's a passage in the Quran that talks about the early Muslims winning the Battle of Badr against the infidels, against all odds. There's a passage in the Quran that says about this battle, you think you threw the stones, but in fact it was Allah who threw the stones that beat the enemy. Now the normal reading, I shouldn't say normal, I should say the mainstream Muslim reading of these passages was and is that that event, that battle involved divine intervention. God intervened on the side of the Muslims and won the battle for them. But you had a more hardcore group of radical right-wing theologians, if I can call them that, who took that as an allegory for all events, that God does everything directly, that I can't pick up this piece of paper, that God is picking up the piece of paper for me, and so on. This became a very influential stream of thought within Islam. And of course, this led to problems, you can imagine, like if I murder somebody, is God actually moving the knife for me and killing the other person? And if so, why should I go to hell for it? And so on. That was debated but somewhat passed over because the idea of God's absolute omnipotence has never been quite as frightening within Islam as it is for Christians. Um, there's, there's more of a willingness to accept God's utter omnipotence and our inability to question his decisions, at least in some strands of Islam. Well, so there, there came to be the example of fire burning cotton, the idea that when fire burns cotton, it's actually God burning cotton. It looks like the fire is touching the cotton and setting it on fire, but actually the fire burning next to the cotton is simply the occasion for God to intervene and make it look like something is happening, but it's actually God's direct influence. All right. This remained confined to the Islamic context for seven or eight hundred years. It did not enter into the Christian Middle Ages in Europe. It wasn't an idea that would have gone very well with medieval Christian philosophy. Ironically, it, re -entered, it entered Europe through modern philosophy. When you had Descartes positing two kinds of finite substances, mind and body. God is the third infinite kind. But you have mind and body. The question for Descartes was, how can mind affect body? How can you decide to move your arm? They're two totally different kinds of substance. And his solution, of course, was that God must be bridging that gap for you. And that's what starts to get called occasionalism in the European context. Uh, Malebranche, after Descartes, brought this back for body-body interactions, which Descartes wasn't so interested in. Descartes tended to think of the physical universe as one giant physical body that didn't need God to come in and, and make the connections happen. Malebranche brought back the Arab problem of body-body interactions. And all throughout the 17th century of philosophy, you have other philosophers, Leibniz, Spinoza, 
um, Barclay, who think that God is somehow involved in causation. Okay, we can laugh at that now as a quaint notion. We can say, oh, these, these naive religious people in the past thought that God was coming in and doing everything, except that we do much the same thing in our time, modern philosophy. We don't say God is the universal mediator of all cause and effect. We say the human mind is. So you get David Hume saying, we're not, in the 1700s, we're not really sure if there's cause and effect out there. We just form the habit of thinking that every time I touch the fire, it seems to hurt, so I won't touch the fire again because it must have the property of burning. I can't prove it, but just by habit, I get into the habit of thinking the fire is going to burn me. In Kant's philosophy, it's even more explicit. Kant says cause and effect is a, is a category of the human understanding. We can't have any idea whether it's really cause and effect out in the real world, so that it's something provided by our minds. So it's something kind of an ups upside down occasionalism. Hume and Kant, who are the very pillar of modern European philosophy, modern Western philosophy, is the idea that the human is like the god of early modern and medieval philosophy, the thing that comes in and makes all causal interaction possible. And of course, I think we need to get away from that. Uh, we had a moment where Whiteheads brought God back in as the universal communicator um, in the 1920s, which was very bold. And then we have Bruno Latour today, who makes a similar but strangely different case. Latour, of course, loves Whitehead, and Latour is actually probably more religious personally than Whitehead was. You know, Latour is a pretty serious Catholic, and yet Latour does not have this habit of bringing God in to solve problems philosophically whenever he needs it. That's something he tries to avoid. So he, he talks about it in secular terms. In Pandora's Hope, Latour talks about politics and neutrons, the connection between politics and neutrons. You wouldn't think there's any connection, right? And neutrons were discovered by Chadwick, late 20s, early 30s, and uh, no one would have imagined there was any political use for them. Until, of course, it was found out that slow neutron fission is the key to the atomic bomb. And who linked protons and uh, sorry, politics and neutrons together? At least in France, it was Frédéric Joliot, the son-in-law of the Curies, married to the daughter of the Curies, and all four of them won Nobel Prizes. Uh, he was the one who tried to make the case to the French government that they should invest in an atomic bomb project, despite having very scarce resources for the forthcoming war. And then France was out of the war and couldn't do it. But Latour says, Joliot is the link between politics and neutrons, and any link between any two things has an intermediary, just like an occasionalism. It's not just God, though, and it's not just human mind, but it's some third term has to be between any two things. Well. There's a problem with Latour's version of the theory, which is that if Jolio is the bridge between politics and neutrons, what's the bridge between Jolio and politics, and what's the bridge between Jolio and neutrons? You've just pushed the problem a step further back. And if I say, what's the connection between Jolio and neutrons? Uh, scientific instruments. Okay, then what's the connection between Jolio and scientific instruments? His eyeball. What's the connection between Jolio and his eyeball, his nervous system? You can keep going back almost infinitely. And Latour's solution to this is somewhat disappointing. He says, you stop when it gets boring. You know, Jolio's connection, the connection between his nervous system and his eyeball is probably not that interesting unless you're a physiologist. So just give it up. Yeah, that's okay if you just need the method for sociological purposes. But if you're trying to solve the philosophical problem, it doesn't really give an explanation for how you can link those two things together. But I wasn't going to talk about that. I was going to talk about Morton's insight. I think it's a real insight that causation itself has to be aesthetic, meaning that causation between two objects is never direct. There's never a direct link between any of the things. Just as the human relation with the world, according to Triple O, is always indirect, always occurs through some mediator, some image, some indirect means, some metaphor, Morton holds that all causation happens this way as well. And for this reason, he concludes that politics must be aesthetic as well. Now, this is a more controversial idea because there's been so much written against the aestheticization of politics which has been associated with, with fascism. You, when you hear the aestheticization of politics, you think of critiques of Lenny Riefenstahl's documentary on the Nuremberg rally, and all right, fine. That kind of aestheticization may be a bad thing. But the aestheticization of politics in terms of not having direct, ac as sorry, direct access to political knowledge is important, and this requires something like an aesthetic access to political truth. And I could go off in a lot of different directions here, but I've, I've Kept you attentive long enough. Thank you very much for listening to that long talk. I'll, I'll take a few questions before we start the discussion, I think. Yeah. Yeah.